Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our biweekly press briefing. Um, I want to start off uh, by recognizing Officer Phipps, who died tragically in the line of duty as a deputy sheriff in Grayson County, um, previously served with Louisville Metro Police, um, and it's important that we recognize his sacrifice. There are many people within LMPD that worked with him and know him, and are, um, you know, they're upset by, the, by his loss. Um, anytime a, a, a police officer dies in the line of duty, I think it's, a, it's another one of those moments uh, for us, regardless of whether we know the officer, or friends with the officer, or if it's someone we, we never met. Um, it's one of those moments where uh, it, gives us, it gives us a moment to reflect on why we do this job and, and the sacrifices that people are willing to make to keep other people safe. So um, definitely want to recognize uh, Officer Phipps um, before we start this uh, press conference. Uh, I'm going to turn it over right now to uh, soon-to-be Assistant Chief Donnie Burbrink, and he's going to give you the biweekly update on crime. Good afternoon. So going through our numbers, since the last press conference that the chief had, we've had three additional homicides. Uh, we're up about 7%. Uh, for homicides for the year. As far as our non-fatal shootings, we went up 13 from the last press conference, but we're down of almost 10% with our non-fatal shootings. Our robberies, we're down significantly in robberies. We're down 36% in robberies. Now, I know the last uh, press conference we had, it said robberies, carjackings. These are robbery numbers only. Our carjacking numbers, though, we're at uh, 114 for this year as opposed to 108 from last year. So we're up about 5% on uh, carjackings from this time last year. However, you take all those numbers and you put them in the, add them all together, we're down about 6% on all these violent crimes for the city this year. Now, I know last week somebody asked about uh, stolen vehicles. With stolen vehicles, we've actually had 4,093 stolen or attempted stolen vehicles in the city for this year, as opposed to last year when we had 4,852. So we're down about 16% on our stolen vehicles. You know, each week, the chief and the command staff, we meet and we go over all of our crime numbers that we have throughout all the divisions. By doing that, it gives us the opportunity to come up with different strategies that we can work together with and combat these numbers in a more consistent effort, which the raw data is very important for us to do that. So having these numbers, they're very important for us to be able to look at this and, and come up with different ways to make things better. Uh, as far as the uh, homicide arrests go, we went, we've had uh, three additional arrests from this time last year, or I'm sorry, from the time last press conference. We're at 62 total arrests for non-fatal shootings, and we've had five more federal indictments. Usually those are going to be done by our criminal interdiction division. Uh, they work closely with our federal partnership, or work with our federal partners, to indict some of our more violent offenders, try to get them uh, better sentences, and provide them more time off the street for our citizens in Louisville. Now, over the past few weeks, one of the things that has been the most pressing for a lot of our citizens has been the street racing issues that we've encountered. And because of that, we've invested a little bit more time, some resources, some manpower to try to combat the, uh, the street racing issue. What you're going to see in the next few slides is with the ordinance that we've worked with the uh, council on, being able to confiscate some of these cars and take them off the streets for a while. And what we're able to seize, it's making an impact. And we'll show you some of the cars that we've actually gotten over the past two weeks. <coughs> now, I'm going to be honest, I probably couldn't afford most of those cars in there, so that's pretty, they're pretty nice cars. What I'll say is that we've had 20 plus citations issued and 20 plus cars seized due to the ordinance. 
this is making a major impact. As you can see, this year alone, we've already had 59 cars seized or cited under this ordinance. We've also, since we've actually started doing this, we've had 122. It's starting to make an impact. We're going to see the dividends pay off on this. And I'm excited about how it's going to turn about for us. So this past week, uh, LMPD worked with a lot of the different fire and EMS organizations and Baptist East to put on an, aggra or a, an active aggressor training. We were working with uh, people that work at Baptist East to put them through some type of scenario where they might experience what it would be like in an active aggressor scenario. By doing that, it helps us improve our response, how we deal with the, the problem, but working with EMS and fire because it's not over once the aggressor is done. We have casualties. We have to go work with the, with the EMS and fire to get as much uh, assistance to the victims as we possibly can. Uh, this was actually brought up by Baptist East. They're the one that contacted us to put on the training. So I asked Brian Salee, who is the Director of Security Services for Baptist East in Louisville and LaGrange, to come and talk about the training that we had this past Monday. Brian? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start by sharing that, um, unfortunately, violence in healthcare is on the rise uh, and has been on the rise for some time. And, and as an organization, our, our goal is to ensure the safety and security of our patients and our healthcare workers. Uh, it's absolutely uh, paramount. And to be able to do that and do that in the most effective way, uh, we have to be able to coordinate and collaborate with our community partners and first responders. It can't, it can't really happen any other way. So this was really an opportunity for us to be able to coordinate and collaborate with LMPD, not just LMPD, but a number of different first responder agencies from fire and EMS to be able to bring them into a healthcare setting and train alongside healthcare workers in responding to one of the most, the, the most critical event that uh, can occur. Um, so there was a, um, a, a great partnership that um, we were able to, to foster and to, to lean on to be able to do this, uh, this simulation and this training in a very, most importantly, safe and controlled manner and allow first responders to be in that same venue and to be able to train and exercise alongside of police, fire, and EMS, which is something that we don't really get the opportunity to do because it is, you know, space is such a constraint for us in healthcare. Uh, resources, manpower, uh, resources are always a, a consideration. But um, several, several months of planning uh, went into this and, uh, you know, as an organization, uh, we found just a tremendous amount of, of success and a tremendous amount of value of being able to, again, one, bring first responders in to train alongside healthcare workers and to provide those healthcare workers who are really working in this empathetic ther therapeutic setting, provide them visibility to how they should respond to a critical event if they were faced with that and what that scenario and situation looks like in the most realistic uh, way possible. So. I want to say again thank you to Brian and everyone at Baptist East as well as those in the, the fire service and EMS that, that helped us with this exercise. Uh, doing these types of things I think not only is it important for us but we want you to know that those are the things that, that the agency and the city are, are doing to keep you safe. Um, it is our job to foresee problems that may occur and make sure that we have all of the resources coordinated that we can work together successfully um, to bring about the, the best outcome possible in some of these tragic situations. So those types of events and trainings are, are extremely important for us. Uh, one of the things I want to, I want to feature this for, for you guys, I think this is, this is an absolutely awesome video when you get the chance to see it. But to give you a little background before we, we play this video, um, Officer Baker, second division officer, um, responded to an incident uh, back in February, or no, I'm sorry, back in uh, beginning of August, and um, at a convenience store. It was a it was a consumer with a mental health crisis, uh, who was armed with a very large knife, who was threatening suicide, particularly suicide by cop. And what you're going to see is um, those officers go in and address that that issue. 
obviously in, in situations like this, it's not just the officer or the consumer that, that might be in danger. It's also people in the public that we have to protect. So you're going to see uh, these officers take action um, and, and deal with this subject and bring him under control and get him to the, to the mental health services uh, that were appropriate. And then I'll, I'll give you some follow-up information about those follow-up actions from Officer Baker. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, 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 hey back up. Hey, back up. Hey, back up. Hey. Back up. Hey. Drop the knife. Drop the knife. Let me see your hands. Drop the knife. Drop it. Out of the store, everybody. Out of the store. Just drop it. Amen. Stop walking towards me. I'm going to get tasered. Hey, he dropped it. He dropped it. He dropped it. Hands in the air. Hands in the air. Shoot me, bro. Shoot No, hands in the air. Shoot me. Taser, 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 taser,
there's a little event that we'll be participating in if y'all want to come and talk about that too where we get to honor some of uh some of our uh lmpd officers that are going to be moving up in rank so um, from here i'll turn it over to you all and and take questions Well, I think you see uh, the approach that officers took uh, between this situation and Eaglewood Drive uh, were very similar, right? We, we have to both address the immediate threat uh, that's in front of us. So a person with a knife, um, we have to give them commands to of what we want them to do. So give clear instructions. And you try to, you want to start a dialogue with that person in those situations. So what you saw in Eaglewood Drive was actually even more so of some of the things that, that we're trying to, to push uh, officers to do and, and starting that dialogue and trying to interact with those people and see what is how can we connect with you in a way that's going to de-escalate this situation for the best outcome unfortunately um, in these situations in all situations that require use of force um, the person involved has the majority of the say and the control over these situations we're just trying to influence the outcome through our through our tactics through our communication and so that that ultimately is the difference is what um, what the suspect's behavior is going to dictate uh, to us. That being said, those are both opportunities for us to examine and learn, both from the things that we did well, as well as the things that we can improve. And we are making sure through our performance review board and some other processes that we learn those lessons, both uh, the things we did well and things we need to, need to work on that might have changed uh, the outcome on Eaglewood Drive in a, in a different way. So the question being, um, you've recognized the, the drop in the thefts of Kias and Hondas, and what accounts for that as well as where does that stand right now? I don't have those exact numbers in front of me. We, we might be able to get that to you um, on the Kias and Hondas. But yes, it has, it has dropped. Um, and I think a lot of that accounts to the TikTok generation. They kind of maybe hopefully got tired of it a little bit. But there's also been uh, uh, education efforts by you all, by us, uh, about people not leaving their keys in their car, simple things like that, as well as we've pushed out a lot of those safety locks and things like that. We've handed out hundreds and hundreds of those, as well as um, Kia and Hyundai have also been trying to put out software updates and things like that that make their cars more difficult to, to steal. I know there was some talk about some, some legal action against uh, Kia and Hyundai uh, for creating some circumstances in the way that they built their cars that make it easy to steal. Um, I don't know where that stands. Um, Hopefully that's successful, um, but hopefully the trend continues down and we can we can keep this problem at bay. And the rest is street racing. What I mean, going from Labor Day weekend to now, we've seen a very big shift in just response. Mm -hmm. What's changed between the big event that happened over Labor Day weekend to the separate events you guys responded to? So what's changed between the events uh, Labor Day weekend and and now, and that we have this response out there. Um, part of it is just planning. Um, so when we have intelligence, we act on it. And so when, that's part of what we had this past weekend is we had some information that we, we could have problems related to this. So we put manpower together specifically to deal with that problem. So what you saw on Labor Day weekend were um, normal beat officers that weren't, they weren't even responding to that, um, particularly at 26 and Market. They were going to another run and just happened to rot up on that situation. Um, so us being able to coordinate and plan and put resources in place to deal with that makes it much safer for all of us and the people involved. Um, I think this past weekend we had uh, seven or eight officers out on the detail, um, something to that effect. Um, and they not only seized several cars then, but they have seized multiple cars since then that they've followed up on and been able to track down and, and tow. I think there was a video of some of the cars getting towed out of a Kroger parking lot. Um, and so we're going to continue to do that, and um, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to change their behavior, or they're going to spend a whole lot buying new cars because 
uh, we're going to keep taking them. Um, and we're working on we're working on some new tactics to deal with it too. I know um, one of our state legislators is also working on some some legislation to make it a little bit uh, the penalties a little tougher. Um, so hopefully we get some some support from the state on that as well. Uh, but I, I think um, I think between our, our shifts in tactics and planning, I think we're going to cut this off. It's it's not going to be tolerated here. So what it is, is about, it's about filling those gaps, figuring out where that, that gap was created between the intel that came in and our response to it. And so that's part of a process of making sure that the right information is getting to the right, right places. Um, so we did hear some chatter prior to Labor, Labor Day weekend. Um, but to your point, was it actionable intel or not? Um, we deemed at the, the time that it wasn't. Uh, we clearly sh should have acted on that ahead of time and 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 been more prepared. Um, I am I am much more of a fan of preparing for something that doesn't happen than having to respond to it after the fact. And so we're we're definitely taking that approach, just as we are in in many of our our other violent crimes. You know, I've talked about we need to push officers to be proactive in their response to things, right? Let's not wait until a crime happens and try to clean up the mess or make an arrest afterwards. If there's a crime that we can interrupt, displace, delay, or um, cut off, let's do that. And so that, that is part of what we need to push for overall. It's that proactive approach to making sure that problems don't become real issues for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, because they were just going 20 over. Um, what would you say to like circumstances like that? Like, do you think these this ordinance is being used to just seize cars? No, um, and and honestly, I, I don't know. Somebody going 20 over as as part of a street racing thing and blocking traffic and things like that. That's fine. You can have your day in court. Um, don't participate in it at all. We can seize your car just for sitting there parked and blocking traffic. So if you're participating in this, I don't care if you're going 100 or if you're going zero, we're going to take your car. Um, and understand about the seizure of the car. We, we don't benefit from this. We don't, we don't get extra money. We don't, um, the car is not turned over to be the property of LMPD in this, these situations. These, these cars sit um, because they, the, the people involved have shown that they cannot behave appropriately and keep the public safe. So. Um, the specific case you're talking about, I don't know, but I can tell you that it doesn't matter how fast somebody's going if they're participating in this type of thing, right? Can you um, confirm the number of arrests in relation to the Labor Day street racing, and are you able to like try identifications at this time? Uh, the number of arrests related to it, we can, we can, we can get that uh, followed up. I had I had a preliminary number, but I don't want to give you the the wrong number, so but we can make sure that we get that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, homicide rate obviously up. We're approaching COVID era numbers there, the homicide rate specifically. I see a lot of people talking, uh, a lot of viewers submitting um, emails and comments about, you know, street racing specifically. There's been a big focus on that and the arrest and the response lately. Um, a lot of push from LMPD on the response there. Um, how would you respond to people who are, you know, maybe being critical of how are there's so much action taken on the street, takeover side of things? But where is that happening with the violent crime rate happening? Yeah, and um, I will tell you if I would love to be able to have that type of presence everywhere, right? Um, we have to act on intelligence. If I, if I had intelligence that said somebody was going to be killed at such and such location, uh, we would have hundreds of officers there, right, to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. But don't think that because you see a visible presence responding to a specific type of incident, that, that, that means that we're taking our attention off the other thing. Um, obviously, what we're doing has to improve. The homicide numbers are outrageous and they're unacceptable. Um, and I don't want to recreate a norm. Obviously, what has happened post-COVID or post-2020 and what has become 
uh, unfortunately, the norm in our numbers in homicides and shootings is unacceptable. So I don't want to get to where we go back down to 100 plus homicides and we're, we're like, yay, we did something great. I want to get back down to where we had 49 and 55 homicides. While that's still too many, that's where our norm should be. And as a, as a community, we should not accept at all these level of homicides. And so don't think that just because you're not seeing the visual presence um, that we are not addressing those issues. Um, that's part of the reason why I put up the indictment numbers. Those are, those are violent people. These, these aren't your first time drug offenders that, that we're indicting. These are people that have, have carried guns, that have used guns and continue to do so. And that's why they're gonna go to the federal penitentiary. And so we are trying to make sure that we, we target the most violent individuals and get them off the street. Are there other aspects of addressing violent crime that we need to, we need to do and we need to do better? 100%, 100%. We need to be much more visible in our proactivity out there. We know, you can go back and look at numbers over the years, we know that when officers are proactive, when they're making stops, when they're making arrests, when they're seizing guns, violent crime numbers go down. And so there is a direct correlation between our proactivity and our visibility in that type of enforcement um, and crime numbers. So um, we are putting together many strategies to address that. But yes, it concerns me that people f might think that we are changing our focus to deal with street racers, because um, that is not at all the case. Our priority is still violent crime. Uh, absolutely. I mean, like I said, you, we are in a different era of policing than we were when we were all cops on the street. Um, and some of the things that have changed are absolutely for the better. I think the, the, the average cop riding the beat today is way better, smarter than, than we ever thought about being. Um, probably show a little bit more compassion than, than some of us did. Um, but there were some things that worked, and we locked up a lot of bad people. And, and bad people knew that if I stand on the corner with a gun in my pocket, there's a decent chance LMPD is gonna be after me. And criminals need to have the fear that LMPD is right around the corner and it's about to get you. Um, and so that's part of what we have to focus on is we, we need to go out there and proactively police and be aggressive in that, in our enforcement strategies. We do. Um, the other aspect of it is how we do that, right? So. We can get caught in this, this cycle of saying, do one thing versus the other, but it's not, it's, it's, it's all of it. So we, we have to do those community things as well. So we can treat people great. We can build relationships with the community. We can make sure that you, who live in a neighborhood where you feel like you're victimized by, by violent crime every day, knows that the police are here to take care of you. We can do that without violating rights and still keep you safe at the same time. So it, it's a combination of things, and that's part of what you've heard me talk about, that we're going to roll out a crime strategy that's in conjunction with uh, a community safety plan by the mayor's office. And so that's part of it, is how, how we use proactive policing and proactive contacts and strategies in conjunction with some of those drivers of crime from a societal level and build those relationships at the same time. So long, complicated answer. Uh, I feel like we're in a, in a really good, good place um, within LMPD. I think I, I get the feeling that people are excited about what's going on right now. The, the command staff that we've assembled, um, they know the task. They know it's a big job ahead of them. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's now, five years ago, 10 years from now, it's always going to be a big task at, at, this, at, at this job. Um, but I think officers understand, are starting to understand what's being asked of them. And they know that we as a command staff are going to support them and guide them in the right direction. And so I get the feeling that uh, morale is, is in a really good place right now. Um, and when officers feel good about themselves, they feel good about the place they work, they do a better job taking care of the community. And so that's what we're driving towards. Wouldn't that be pretty awesome? 
Like we could do a press conference and we could pull up all those cars out here and take like a, a, a steamroller and, and roll over a, a Corvette or something. Like that'd be pretty neat. Um, I mean, I feel bad for the little 19 year old who took his parents' car out, but um, that's on them. Um, no, I mean, whatever we can do to be a deterrent. Like this is a this is a dangerous thing. Like I get it. Like I don't tell my dad, but I mean, I took his his Impala Super Sport out a couple of times when he wasn't looking, but. I wasn't doing that, right? Like, this is dangerous. This is no joke. Like, we're looking at this and you're saying, you know, well, why are we giving this so much attention? Because people are getting hurt. We have, a, I think somebody saw a kid get run over last weekend by one of these cars that were spinning. Did you see what happened up in Indianapolis with all the police cars and, and things being damaged? We had a shooting a couple of weeks ago related to it. Like, this is a big deal. Um, and so anything that we can do to make sure that we cut this down, we're then going to cut it down by convincing them that it's not worth it, or we're going to take their means by which to do it. So, please don't run that part about me taking my dad's car. I still don't think he knows. At this point in time, is there any update um, on the Officer Brinkley investigation? On the Officer Brinkley investigation from Walmart? Yes. Um, that investigation is still ongoing. Um, I believe he's been interviewed. Um, he's in he's in good spirits, um, but as far as any new specific information, um, I, I don't have any updates. It's one of those deals where, like like we've said, information and, and the process of the investigation takes time. PIU is working it, um, and they'll get that over to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office for review, and then it'll go to to PS, PSU for the administrative side. So in the meantime, you'll stay on modified assignment. No, so. Um, We'll make a decision as a command staff probably here in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, his, his, that incident's already been before our performance review board, so I'll get the preliminary uh, look at that, and we'll make a decision uh, as a command staff about, about bringing him back. Um, some of these, you know, like I said, I don't, I'm not here to make a prejudgment before the case is completed, um, but there's nothing in that case that I've seen so far and in the video that, you know, you've all seen that, um, would lead me to believe that he doesn't need to go back to the street and, and continue doing the good work he did. Um, so, yep. Last one. Circling back to the street takeovers, the guns that were seized in the process, how many have been seized so far in the last three weeks? Do you know that number? Is it on the slide? Yeah. The last two weeks, we know it was two. two. So two guns in the last week, and then... The week before that, I think there were four the so week before that. With those handguns, I mean, is there any history on those guns um, in terms of if they've been involved in other crimes that you guys have found, uh, if they were in possession illegally? That so that, that's, that's a good question. Well, obviously, if we took them, they were in possession illegally. Um, so, or else we, uh, you know, those are your constitutional rights if it's not illegal. Um, but that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and I brought up, you know, CID earlier. And part of what they do is they screen every gun arrest that we make and every seizure that we make. And they work with the ATF to see if those guns have been used in other crimes. And we have a, a, a NIBIN unit, which runs those, those guns and checks, checks the guns to see if evidence uh, from those guns have, have shown up in other crime scenes. And so it, it's one of those things where really smart people and analysts and stuff, not people like me, um, are able to connect the dots between a gun that we seize today and crimes that happened in the past but that's not an overnight thing. So that's something that the analysts work on. And then they'll screen those cases uh, for the court for prosecution. And some of those cases are, are those exact cases that you saw that end up getting federally indicted where we have armed career criminals and prohibited possessors that get picked up by the ATF or um, otherwise go to federal court, or we have a good case in state court. So at this point, you haven't had any hits just because of the process? Yeah, they may have. I mean, they, they, they work a lot of guns. so. Uh, they may have. I don't know about from these specific ones. Yeah. So. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Have a good day.